All right, so one of the things that I find really interesting about God and that I love about God is how he intertwines his will and his purpose for us. God loves, like Pastor Scott said a couple weeks ago, he loves to take us from here to there. He loves that in between because that's where the change happens. That's where the transformation happens. He loves to transform us, to, to save us from our sins and make us a new creation. He's the only one that can do that. He's the only one who can change the heart, truly change the heart of a man. And I think that if you study Jesus' actions in the New Testament, many times you will see that when he performed an outwardly sign of wonder, of something amazing, a miracle, many times if, if you look at it, the external thing that he did it was always something a little deeper and inward he also was trying to accomplish too. For, for his disciples, for the people around him, he was always up to something more. And he still is. He, he's always up to something more than what meets the eye. And many times that deeper truth that he was trying to show through those miracles and signs was a truth about the kingdom of heaven. He talked a lot about the kingdom of heaven, about the original design for humanity before sin. Or sometimes he loved to just reveal a little characteristic or nature of, of who God is. For he always seemed to be up to something. So I want to, before we jump into Nehemiah chapter 5 today, I want to show you an example of this in Mark. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 45. So um, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus just fed the 5,000. He just had that miraculous sign. He he multiplied the fishes and the loaves. All the disciples saw it. The people there saw it. And then what we're going to read is directly after that. And Mark is going to describe another miracle. Jesus walking on the water. But he describes it in a little bit of an interesting way. And that's what I want us to look at. So Mark chapter 6 verse 45. He, said, he says immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. To Bethsaida. And while he dismissed the crowd, or why he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. Now this last sentence is what I want you guys to really see. It says, And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. One of these things is not like the other, one of these sentences. This, this sticks out. It's like, that was the last story. We're in, we're in this story. Why, why are you connecting these two stories with two different miracles? But I don't think they're quite as disconnected as we think. It says they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves. This might seem random until we realize that the disciples were still looking for a Messiah who would reign over their prosperity. So when they saw the miracle of the fishes and loaves, they were like, guys, we got him. This guy can make our, our earthly existence amazing. He's going to bring Israel back on top. I mean, he can multiply. He can, he can actually adjust and alter our physical reality. Like, how are we ever going to be stopped? But they were missing the point. They hadn't yet grasped that Jesus was after something inside to them. And it wasn't all about taking authority and, and conquering over the external circumstances that Jesus came to be their spiritual substance that they needed. Jesus came to be the bread of life himself. The bread that would be broken for their sins. They just couldn't grasp that. So they did not understand about the loaves. So with all this in mind, understanding that this is kind of how God works, he, he has the power to do amazing things in this physical, but often when he's doing those things, He's also doing an inward work, and he values that inward work. So I want us to take this lens, and I want us to look at it through that lens at Nehemiah chapter 5, because this is the same God that we're reading about. So in a similar way, when we look at that, we see that God often reveals the deeper work he's doing through the external circumstances. 
So in this situation, what are the external circumstances? We know that God has sent Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the wall, to make the city habitable again. And the people, as they, as they join together, Israel joins Nehemiah on this mission. We see that while they're going through this, there's some things inside that come to light that really desperately are in need of healing. So let's read the first part of this chapter, chapter 5, together. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, We're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our homes to get grain during the famine. And still others were saying, We've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. But some of our daughters have already been enslaved, so we're powerless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. So Nehemiah says, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles, and now you're selling your own people, only for them to be sold back to us. And they kept quiet because they could not find anything to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give them back immediately their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, and also the interest that you are charging them. One percent of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. And they said, we will give it back, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. So we see here, what we see here is a pretty large economic crisis taking shape. And it's taking place predominantly, it's affecting the farmers on the land. These were people already being taxed heavily by Perdera. And now those same people are giving free labor to aid Nehemiah on his efforts to rebuild the wall. Which means they're not at home. They're not trying to make the best of their crops. They're not trying to make their homes and their vineyards and their properties as valuable as they can. And then on top of all of this, sprinkle in a little drought on the land, and we've got a problem. All of these variables combined, we see a people struggling. They're struggling so much that we see three different groups in this text kind of arise. Three different Jewish groups come forward and they complain. The first group are landless farmers. And they're complaining because, because they don't really have any property or, or because they don't have any land, they're being forced to pledge the only thing they do that have, or the only thing they have left that has value. And that's their own sons and daughters. So they're putting their, their children to be slaves just to buy food. Another group complains that they're pledging their fields, their vineyards, and even houses in order to buy grain. And still another group is struggling to pay the tax. So they're having, in order to pay, borrow silver, in order to pay the tax, the only way they can do this is to use their own property as collateral. And the worst part about this suffering going on, the, the worst part about the situation and the complaints is that the creditors, the people on the other side of this, the ones who are lending the money, the, the ones who are acquiring the interest and seizing the property, were Jews, their own people. The wealthy and the nobles in the land oppressing their own people. Jews being sold as slaves to Jews, relatives holding debt over the heads of relatives. And Nehemiah gets word of all of this. And he's means rightfully angry. He hears the outcry of the people and he's furious and he's led to action. So he gathers the nobles and officials and he holds them accountable of all of this. So this is how I imagine that Nehemiah's thought process going into this meeting. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever tried to do a favor for somebody and they make it really hard for you to do that favor? But you want to bless them and they just make it so hard for you to do it. You're already going out of your way to do whatever it is to gather resources and you're having people from their busy schedules and, and you're taking money and energy and time away from your life because you're gonna, you have it in your mind, I'm gonna bless these people. 
And then because of their lack of communication or, or because they're just not good at explaining what they need, they just make it really hard for you to give them that favor. And so it's like, it's, it's infuriating. It's like, let me help you. I'm trying to help you. Just receive it. Help me. Help you. Please. <laughs> I remember my brother uh, told me uh, one time that he was doing a project of web design for a friend of his. And web design, it takes expertise and knowledge and he programmed it in and a lot of time. And he was doing this for free for a friend. He had it in his mind, I'm going to bless them with this. And he's going above and beyond. He's probably 90% of the way through the website. And the only 10% that he has left is like their work. Like give me the information to plug into the website. Give me the pictures, how you want the wording, and I will fill it in and your, your project will be complete. And so he's emailing them, he's calling them, and they're ghosting him. That they're not answering it. So here he has this project that he's taken upon himself as a burden to his, to his life to bless. And they're just making it so hard. That's how I imagine, maybe I'm being dramatic, but that's how I imagine Nehemiah feeling. He's like, guys, I got the king financing this construction. I rallied the people to give their own time and energy and resources to rebuild this wall. I'm giving my own personal resources to help this project. And I'm already being opposed, like we've been talking about the last couple weeks, by external authorities. I've got a lot going on. But now, what's my stumbling block? Our own people? Like, get out of your own way. We're trying to help each other. Like, come on. You guys won't stop collecting and taking advantage of your own people. He says in verse 8, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you're selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. Why are we oppressing our own people? And I love this next verse. I think it's the key. Verse 9. He says, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? What an awesome question. He knew just what to say to, to strike that chord. What a loaded question. I feel like in that one question, we see him when I ask like five different questions. Despite the situation, despite the circumstances we're in, shouldn't we live differently because of the God that we serve? Because we are his children, shouldn't we make choices differently? Put aside for a second these external efforts that we're doing. Put aside the project that we're trying to accomplish. And let's just talk about what's going on in our hearts. Should we not treat our, our fellow brothers, our people, better than we would a foreigner? Should we reflect that we live for a loving God who delights in showing mercy? Shouldn't we live like the God that we serve has provided for us throughout our entire history as a people so that we don't have to take advantage of others to further our, our own will and kingdom? And then we see Nehemiah called them to action after this. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our Lord? Stop demanding interest. Give back what has been taken. And I don't want to blow past this point. The people listen. A lot of times we read these stories and the people have hard hearts. But here we see people listen. And we're going to look a lot in this message at Nehemiah because he reflects some truly amazing characteristics. Characteristics of how God acts. But I don't want to blow past this, the leader's response. It takes so much humility to receive a rebuke and to do something about it. It takes so much humility to, to receive the rebuke, and then we know that true repentance is followed by righteous action. So I'm receiving, I know what I've done is wrong, but now we're going to do something to make it right. And they do that. The leaders listen and they obey the Amalek's commands, and they give back what has been taken. Church, we need that type of humility. When we're, when we're called out, when, when we're struck to the heart and we are convicted, we need to have the humility it takes to get before God and say, God, somewhere along the way I failed. Somewhere along the way I made this Christianity thing about me. And I need to realign myself to you. And I need to repent and teach me what to do to live for you, to walk in the fear of the Lord. In the beginning, I said that God often reveals the deeper work he's doing through the external circumstances we walk through. So we see here that God is desiring Israel to be healed. God is desiring Israel to be delivered of their wickedness on the inside, just as much as he wants to see them be healed externally and to rebuild the wall. Sure. 
God desires you to be healed and delivered from your sin. Just as much as he wants you to go do amazing things in his name and, and live a good life with them. He wants you to be changed, transformed personally into the reflection of his son, Jesus. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 12, Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. And I also shoot out the folds of my robe and said, In this way may God shoot out their house and possessions. Anyone who does not keep this promise, so may such a person be shaken out and empty. And at this the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. When we as followers of Christ allow God's will to be our mission, we can come together and be united despite any external circumstance. The enemy will do everything in his power to send to us stumbling blocks, to, to put Goliaths in our path, to, to, to slow us down, to slow God's people down from fulfilling his will. And then when through the power of Christ we conquer those Goliaths and we press forward, the enemy's fallback strategy has never changed. It's always moved from external to let's cause division within the people. Let's isolate them. Let's make enemies out of themselves. When we walk in the fear of the Lord, when we live our lives as living sacrifices for his will and his kingdom instead of our own, we will always be united. We have a common goal, a common purpose, a common God. God has no division within himself. Jesus said to himself, a house divided against itself cannot stand. God has no division within himself. So as his children, we need to live and make choices differently to reflect that. To sacrifice in order to keep unity. The fruit of God's spirit will always be love and peace. So when among ourselves, if there's discontentment and strife, frustration, we must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves enough to come together, yield to Christ's authority, and refix our eyes on the Lord. And on the mission that he has at hand for us. And we see this people does that. People listen. They receive their rebuke. They listen. They come together. And they obey Nehemiah's command. Let's keep reading verse 14. He says, Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to, their governor, uh, to be their governor in the land of Judah, until the 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people. They took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And every ten days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. And in spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor, because the demands were heavy on these people. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. <coughs> Nehemiah showed Jesus. He, he displays what it looks like to walk in the fear of the Lord. To live with the understanding of how great and awesome is our God. What I mean by that is he allowed his relationship with God change the way that he lived. Change the way that he governed. Change the way he related to his men. It even changed the way he perceived problems that came up. Because he knew that our God is so great and awesome, nothing can stand in our way. He lived differently because of who his mighty God is. Why wasn't Nehemiah worried about his resources? Why wasn't he worried about his funds, getting what's his, his food, getting what he rightfully deserved in his position? Because Nehemiah knows that the God he serves is so great and awesome and will provide for all of his needs. Nehemiah valued his heavenly reward far more than anything that he could build in this world for himself. We must live differently because of who our God is. Because of how mighty and awesome he is. Our life 
needs to reflect the change of a sinner who has been saved and transformed. We must stop living for our little time here on earth. And we must start living for our eternity with our Father in heaven. Nehemiah would not oppress his brother because our God is gracious and compassionate. Nehemiah wants to uphold those who do not protect themselves because God loves to protect the oppressed and to give voice to the voiceless. I see so much of the way that Jesus lived his life in the life of Nehemiah. So much. Jesus made it clear that the greatest among us would be the ones who would lay down their lives to serve. And boy, do we see Nehemiah serve. Nehemiah would rather bring people to his own table than to take from another to raise himself up. He'd, he'd rather bring people in, share out of everything he had, than to take from another to build his kingdom a little higher. So why did he do this? Why did Nehemiah go against the grain so much? Why did he act so differently from in his position than what people expected? Verse 15 answers this for us. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. To live for God is to live differently. To live for God is to play a different game than the rest of the world's playing. To live for God is to go against the grain. To live for God is to live in the world but not of the world. God didn't just send Nehemiah to rebuild the wall. Do we see that? God sent Nehemiah to show what a life truly to live for God looks like. To be an example to the people. This is what God is desiring out of his children. The wall was just a byproduct of this mission. Those things will come. <laughs> Submit to the Lord and, and all these things will be added to you. Nehemiah didn't have the privilege that we do today of looking at Jesus' life play out in the Bible. But yet, he lives differently because of it. He didn't have the privilege of, Jesus, of seeing Jesus' life played out. He didn't get, have the privilege of seeing God conquer death through the life of a man. But yet we see Nehemiah live righteously. And we see him walk in the fear of the Lord. So how much more should we? How much more should our revelation be of how great and awesome God is? Because we've seen the whole picture of his redemptive plans. How much more should we walk in the fear of the Lord? Because we understand the cost that it took for God to redeem mankind back to him. The cost of his beloved son, Jesus. How much more have we all lived? So I want to end by saying this. Who are you in this story? Are you the ones crying out from the oppression? Crying out from the oppression of this world? Do you need to be honest with yourself? Put yourself in a community and be vulnerable and humble enough to ask for help. Is that you this morning? Or are you the ones oppressing other people? Taking advantage of others to hoist yourself up a little higher? To build your kingdom a little bigger? And do you need to repent and say, God, somewhere along the way, I made mean, this about me. I made mean, this, this life purpose about me and, and how I could live the, my, what I consider to be a good life. Instead of how can I live to bring you honor and glory? Do we need to repent? Or are you the one that God has raised up to reflect his character and nature to the world? Are you the Nehemiah? Are you the Nehemiah? I think we should all strive to be the Nehemiah. Who will yield our position, who will yield our authority, our, our resources, our time, our effort, all for the sake of just walking in the fear of the Lord and serving Jesus well. So whatever season of life that you're in right now, I just want to encourage you this morning to take a step back and ask God what internal work he's doing. Ask God to reveal what internal work he's trying to accomplish in your life and what about himself he wants to reveal to you. Is he trying to show you how faithful of a provider he is? Is he trying to show you how great of a healer he is by touching that relationship in your life that needs help? Or does he just want to break down the watch and put him in your head and just show you how great and awesome he is? So whatever your external circumstances are, and you brought in with you today, ask God to reveal what he is doing and yield to his anything. He wants him to partner with him in it, just as Nehemiah partnered with him. He wants to do that because it will greater reveal his glory to you, and that will help you understand who you are 
how to live and walk in the fear of the Lord.